Hi, and welcome to CJJ's webinar on the JGDPA, Looking Back, Looking Forward. I'm Katie Mercier. I'm CJJ's Communications Associate. I just wanted to walk through a couple of technical details before we get started. Um, first, you'll notice that your, the, all participants are in listen-only mode. We're going to do Q&A at the end, so if you have questions, you can either click your, the raise your hand feature at the end of the presentation, and we can unmute you, and then I can call on you. Or you can enter your questions throughout the presentation um, through the questions box. Just, just be specific about what factor, what program, or what slide you're asking questions about so that we, when we get to the end, we, uh, we can give you the best answer possible. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to Naomi Smoot, who will introduce our speakers. Hi, our speakers today are Carmen Doherty, Mark Schindler, and Jill Ward. Carmen is the Campaign for Youth Justice's Policy Director. She assists both state-based organizations and national partners in developing, youth, in developing policy goals related to criminal justice reform. Before coming to the campaign, she served as Deputy Director and Staff Attorney for Advocates for Justice and Education, a DC-based nonprofit formed to educate parents, youth, and the community about the laws governing public education, specifically for children with special needs. In 2008, she was appointed to the D.C. Mayor's Juvenile Justice Advisory Group, where she works with city stakeholders to provide recommendations on district compliance with the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act. Mark Schindler is Executive Director of the Justice Policy Institute, a national nonprofit research and policy organization dedicated to reducing the use of incarceration in the juvenile and criminal justice system. Prior to joining JPI in 2013, he was a partner with Venture Philanthropy Partners, where he led BPP's Social Innovation Fund Youth Connect Initiative, a philanthropic effort aligning public-private capital, evaluation, and high-performing nonprofit organizations to improve the education, employment, and health outcomes of disconnected youth in the national capital region. Previously, he worked on various roles at the D.C. Department of Youth and Rehabilitative Services. He has also served on an array of boards and committees. Jill Ward is a consultant for the Campaign for Youth Justice with a portfolio of both, of both state and national nonprofit clients. She previously held senior policy positions with Girl Scouts of the USA, the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence, and the Children's Defense Fund, where she served as co-chair of the National Juvenile, Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Coalition. Jill also worked for Senators Sarbanes and Mitchell. From 2009 to 2010, she was a member of Maine's Juvenile Justice Task Force which develop recommendations for state juvenile justice reforms that incorporate evidence-based practices and research-guided program principles. And with that, we'd like to turn the presentation over to Mark Schindler. Good afternoon, and thank you. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for joining us this afternoon to talk about uh, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act. Um, I'm going to start off by providing a little bit of background on the act and the history of the JJDPA and then turn it over to my colleagues, uh, Jill and Carmen, to go into a little bit more detail, including uh, how folks can, can weigh in and uh, support uh, good, good work in this area. So just by way of background, you know, I'm looking at my first slide here, um, which is the next slide. Great. Uh, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, what, what we all refer to as the JJDPA, is really the landmark piece of juvenile justice legislation uh, federally. Uh, the act, which was passed initially in 1974, authorizes, authorizes federal funds to go to the states for juvenile justice. As you'll hear more throughout this call, that's unfortunately been a declining amount of federal funds, but it still is an important uh, support for states to, to do good work in terms of delinquency prevention and intervention. The, the general expectation uh, for the act is that states would comply with what we refer to as the four core requirements, which we'll talk about in a little bit more, um, and that states would also develop plans for delinquency prevention and intervention, and you'll hear more about that as well. The original act in 1974 also created the Federal Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, which is uh, the federal department within the Department of Justice that is charged with uh, implementation of the act as well as oversight and technical assistance uh, services to the states. Uh, OJJDP um, has played a critical role over the years, although again funding has limited their ability to be as effective uh, as, as they have in the past. Uh, in addition, each state, as you probably know, has an advisory group uh, referred to as a juvenile justice advisory group, and that
uh, group is appointed by the chief executive of the state, either the governor or, in some cases, a mayor, like here in the District of Columbia. And those groups generally uh, create plans and decide how to allocate federal funds. Uh, Carmen will speak more to, to those groups in, in some detail in a few moments. So let's, let's move forward. Um, I want to give a little bit of background, and folks on the call may, may be familiar with this, um, but I think it's good to, to think in context in terms of where we are now and how we got here. So as, as many of you know, the first juvenile court was established in 1899 in Chicago, uh, not only the first juvenile court in the United States, but the first juvenile court in the world. Uh, the focus at that time was really about individualized treatment and rehabilitation for young people. And it was the first significant effort uh, through the juvenile justice system, through a court uh, mechanism to differentiate between young people, between children and adults in the legal context. And within 30 or so years, uh, juvenile courts had spread throughout the country. Um, and generally, through the early to mid-1900s, uh, we saw a proliferation of juvenile courts, not just in this country, but around the world. In the 1960s, uh, what we refer to as the due process uh, protections uh, sort of phase of juvenile justice, we saw the, the Supreme Court weigh in and look closely at what was happening in juvenile courts. Uh, again, they were set up for the purposes of treatment and rehabilitation, um, but didn't always work as intended. And what, what was observed was significant um, uh, lack of protections for young people in terms of their legal rights. So during the, the 60s, we saw a number of landmark Supreme Court cases uh, that provided due process protections to, to children in juvenile court. That included such cases as N. Ray Galt, which provided a right to counsel in juvenile court, cases like N. Ray Winship, uh, which established uh, a beyond a reasonable doubt standard in juvenile court. We also saw, however, the Supreme Court um, limit in some ways the protections, and so uh, continuing to differentiate between uh, kids and adults. So, for example, the Supreme Court ruled in the, in the McIver case uh, that there would be no right to a jury trial uh, for children in juvenile court. So, we, But we do have now an increase, um, uh, particularly in due process protections uh, due to that, those developments in the 60s. Towards the end of the 60s, we saw really, in many ways, the first uh, substantial involvement of the federal government in, in juvenile justice issues, and that was in 1968, which the passage of the Juvenile Delinquency Prevention and Control Act. That act also assigned responsibility to uh, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare we're developing a national approach to the quote-unquote problem of juvenile delinquency. Um, states were to prepare and implement juvenile delinquency plans and upon approval receive federal funds to carry out both prevention, rehabilitation, training, and research programs. So that was in, in 1968 um, and that really brings us to uh, the, the, the landmark legislation on the next slide the 1974 Act. And so in 1974, uh, the JJDPA was, was passed in Congress. Um, I should note that contrary to uh, what we've seen recently, and you'll hear more about this in, in a few minutes, uh, the, the Act when passed in 1974 really enjoyed overwhelming uh, bipartisan support from both houses of Congress. The hearings that occurred in 73 and 74 were largely centered around um, abuses of young people, uh, primarily in jails. And there was a lot of support for Congress acting to ensure that uh, protections would be put in place. So again, bipartisan uh, support from both houses of Congress and a, a very broad coalition of organizations uh, supporting passage of, of the landmark legislation. That included groups uh, ranging from the ACLU to the American Legion um, and others. So a very, very broad uh, coalition of organizations uh, weighing in on the act. And the initial act, as you'll see on, on the next slide, uh, established uh, what are the initial core protections, right? And so 
1974, the Act included a uh, separation requirement to keep young people separated from adults when they were held in adult jails, and also deinstitutionalization of status offenders, what we refer to as the DSO requirement. You'll hear more about that. Um, and that is uh, as it relates to young people who are charged with offenses that would not be uh, crimes if they were adults, such as running away from school, truancy, and, and generally out of control, or what was referred to as incorrigible behavior. So that was in 1974, broad passage uh, of the act, and really the first time that these protections were, were put in place. Moving forward in terms of the history, uh, in 1980, uh, there was the addition of the jail removal requirement, uh, which uh, required states not to hold young people in adult jails if they were under juvenile court jurisdiction. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, unfortunately, there was also the addition at that time of what we refer to as the valid court order exception in the, the DSO requirement. And what the valid court order exception did is allow uh, judges to hold young people or detain young people in secure confinement in detention centers if they had violated a court order. In other words, if they were brought in, placed on probation, which was often the case uh, for a status offense, but if they came back and violated the court order, they could then be detained. And, and we'll talk about how that is playing out uh, today and some of the uh, things going on in Congress to uh, hopefully address that. In 1988, uh, through reauthorization, the uh, Congress added the disproportionate minority confinement um, language. This was not a, a core mandate at that point or a core requirement, uh, but did uh, introduce and, and put in language that encouraged looking at the disproportionality, the disproportionate treatment of uh, children of color, which I think everybody knows is a very significant issue within the juvenile justice system uh, throughout the country. Um, that issue got more attention as we move forward uh, in 1992. At that point, uh, the DMC requirement, as we know it, was elevated to a core requirement. In other words, where federal funding uh, was tied to the states coming to compliance with the various core protections, and DMC was elevated at that time. We also saw the addition then of Title V local delinquency prevention grants uh, for the states. Moving along to the next slide. So here, just, just a quick summary, and you'll hear more about this from, from my colleagues. Um, but we have today, and, and have had in place since the uh, 90s, essentially, uh, it has not changed uh, substantially. What we refer to as the four core protections, some refer to as the, the core requirements or mandates. And these are the four substantial requirements in the Act that states must comply with or uh, put at risk their federal juvenile justice funds. And so just quickly to, to mention these uh, again, the first is jail removal, and that says that, that juveniles under juvenile court jurisdiction uh, should not be placed in adult jails. That's, that's an important distinction uh, because it doesn't apply to young people held in adult jails who are being prosecuted as adults. It does apply pre- and post-trial uh, for young people under juvenile court jurisdiction. Additionally, we have sight and sound separation, uh, and these are for young people who may be held temporarily in an adult jail. It's more often the case in rural areas where there may not be a, a juvenile detention center nearby and a young person may be held for a temporary uh, period of time in an adult jail. The requirement is that in order to keep that young person safe, they must be separated from adult inmates by both sight and sound. So that's the sight and sound requirement. Moving on to the next slide. Again, the deinstitutionalization of status offenders uh, we use DSO since it's otherwise a, a mouthful. Uh, again, that uh, requires that uh, youth who are charged with offenses that wouldn't be crimes if they were adults uh, cannot be locked up unless, and that's the substantial uh, exception, they violate a valid court order. And finally, the disproportionate minority contact requirement uh, 
where states must address the problem of overrepresentation of youth of color uh, in the juvenile justice system. So currently, we do have the, the four protections in place. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the incentives uh, to come into compliance and maintain compliance with those requirements. So that, in some ways, brings us uh, closer to, to where we are now. I want to talk just for a minute on the next slide um, about what we saw and what I think many of you are familiar with that happened in, in the 1990s, which we refer to as, in some ways, the decade of the super predator. And there we really saw, particularly in Congress, but also obviously in states across the country, uh, a get tough uh, tide where in the wake of uh, spikes in, in, in violent crime, including cr crimes by kids, um, a lot of media attention. We saw uh, a trend across the country and in Congress to pass legislation uh, to get tougher on kids. And we saw things like uh, Bill McCollum in Congress talking about the, the threat to public safety that these young people uh, uh, pose and referring to them as, as super predators. In 1996, we saw the first really draconian piece of legislation uh, in Congress on the House side that was authored by uh, Representative McCollum from Florida, and that was known as the Violent Youth Predator Act of 1996. I, I want to pause just for a moment there and just draw your attention to, to that language. So what we went from is, is an act that talked about uh, juvenile delinquency, uh, and prevention to actually using terms like youth predator in the title of legislation, a very significant departure from the original intentions of the, of the legislation. Um, the Senate also had introduced legislation in 97, the Violent Repeat Juvenile Offender Act, and essentially what these, what these proposals did would, would weaken the protections that were in place and also encourage states to uh, do things like try more kids as adults um, in the adult criminal justice system. In some ways, this was, uh, this led to, in many ways, uh, the creation and emergence of what we refer to as the National Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Coalition. So in the late 90s and in the early 2000s, when the, when the act was being considered for the reauthorization, a number of national groups and groups from around the country uh, really rallied, in some ways, trying to recreate the coalition that had, uh, had uh, pushed for passage in the, in the 70s um, and in many ways successfully pushed back on these uh, more draconian uh, measures. And so the act was not, uh, those, those bills did not pass Congress, thankfully. Um, and I think we, we have started to see um, a move back towards uh, more of a recognition that, that young people should be protected uh, within, within our systems. And so um, last reauthorized uh, in 2002 uh, and quite successful in the fact that there were not major substantive changes uh, to the act. We actually had a strengthening or an expanding of the DMC requirement where it uh, expanded the requirement to look not just at young people of color who were in confinement but also to uh, their contact with the justice system. As many of you know, that initial contact with, with police is, is an important point in the system uh, where disparities start. So uh, the 90s really um, showed that we could push back um, and that Congress's attention could uh, be drawn to more effective strategies, um, and that resulted in, in the last reauthorization in 2002. I think with, with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Jill Ward, to continue this, the story of uh, the JJDPA. Thanks very much for your attention. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, everybody, for uh, joining the call today. I'm going to pick up on the next slide where Mark left off. Um, with the last reauthorization, which was in 2002, and give you a little bit more background about how that happened and why um, things were largely unchanged, either for the good or for the bad, which is sort of an insight into how uh, Congress legislates, I think. So in 2002, we were five years overdue for a reauthorization. Um, prior to that, it was the 1992 reauthorization. The JJDPA has generally been authorized for five years at a time. And again, we 
had a hard time getting Congress to focus and sometimes didn't want them to. As Mark pointed out, a lot of the legislation being proposed was um, regressive and very harsh with respect to how it characterized young people and, and what we should do about juvenile delinquency and crime. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So um, in some senses, it was good that nothing happened. Uh, the law did stay in place, as some of you may be familiar with, through the appropriations process. Um, so Congress continued to appropriate funds for the JJDPA, even though technically the authorization had expired. And generally speaking, when that happens in Congress, um, the administration, OJJDP, defaults to the last authorization that was in statute for its guidance. So you sort of get a status quo situation when you don't have um, reauthorization being enacted on the timeline that's outlined in, in the statute. So we did get a reauthorization in 2002. Part of the reason um, there wasn't much change was because it was attached to a larger bill authorizing the entire Department of Justice. So it was seen by the National Coalition at the time as an opportunity to get the JJDPA reauthorized without some of the threatening uh, proposals that were embodied in some of those bills from the 1990s. And we were just starting to get a little bit better data about what was really happening with young people and being able to more effectively push back on this super predator myth that ended up being recounted ultimately in the late um, 1990s and early 2000s as, as juvenile crime and delinquency continued to decline. So um, we did get the reauthorization done, as Mark pointed out. We did get one expansion of the disproportionate minority confinement protection to um, change to be contact, which allowed for a broader interpretation of all the different points in the justice system where there might be disparate treatment. Uh, there was a consolidation of some targeted programs um, into Title II, but appropriators didn't really follow that entirely. So we still sort of had status quo with how that funding stream came through to the states. And as I mentioned, is not part of JJDPA, but separately, the Juvenile Accountability Block Grant was finally authorized. And that's important. And I think um, those of you on the call probably received some JVIC funds in your state. I raise it because it was one of the few uh, pieces of legislation that was getting increased funding at a time when all of these other attacks and proposals were coming along around the JJDPA. And I think that's sort of important to note uh, because we as a coalition then picked it up to advocate for the funding because it was a good resource for states who were trying to do different things, um, reforms in their, with their systems when the other funding was on the decline. So having gone through the 1990s um, and the early 2000s, there was a feeling among members of the National Coalition to be prepared and to sort of lay some groundwork for the next reauthorization. Um, we had better data, the sort of public sentiment and receptiveness to some of the messaging of the 1990s had changed. Importantly, state legislatures were moving back away from some of those um, re more regressive policies. So the National Coalition, which is a pretty broad group of a range of organizations, I think even reflected in the range of groups that Mark highlighted that first got behind the JJDPA when it was um, passed in 1974, have picked up other policy areas but really wanted to have a core group focus on just the JJDPA because it is sort of the landmark piece of federal legislation. So the Act for JJ campaign, next slide please, was created. Um, it was formed in 2005 as sort of a working group or subgroup of the larger coalition. It was co-chaired um, at the time by CJJ and CFYJ. Currently CJJ is um, chairing it solo at the moment. but. Um, came together under the leadership of the Coalition for Juvenile Justice and the Campaign for Youth Justice. Uh, there was a survey of the field conducted on key priorities, a statement 
principles was created that organizations could sign on to. There was a, a lot of outreach and education about what the law does and what we wanted to see as sort of a collective field done to improve upon the law. And um, you know, information was created. There is a website that start, currently exists with a little bit less detail than it did at the time that it was created. And we were working with some active legislation. But again, this was launched in advance of anticipating the next reauthorization, which was set to occur in 2007. So that kind of brings us up to next slide. To when we should have considered reauthorization. So this is going to sound like Groundhog Day all over again, um, because we are now seven years past uh, when we should have last reauthorized the bill. So this is sort of um, common in Congress to sort of punt it down the line. But in 2007, Technically, the JJDPA expired. Uh, the Act for JJ campaign pushed hard for reauthorization in the 110th Congress. There were hearings in both the House and the Senate. The Senate reported out a bipartisan bill, so there was some good work done there to kind of capture, I think, the original essence of the law, getting bipartisan support, and building on um, where we had been previously. That bill didn't get any time on the floor. Next slide. So um, in this next Congress, the bill was reintroduced, again with bipartisan support, um, made it out of the Judiciary Committee, but stopped there. There was no House companion. Um, you may recall that uh, in 2008, when Obama was elected, uh, it took over four years to appoint a permanent OJJDP administrator. So we had sort of not um, permanent leadership in the agency that is most focused on the JJDPA. And we also had, uh, in 2008, 2007 and 2008, the beginning of the Great Recession. And deep cuts were coming down the pike, especially with respect to non-defense discretionary programs, of which the juvenile justice funding is. So we experienced a lot of and I'm going to talk about that um, in a minute, but I just want to give you a little bit of a recap of what, were, what was included in these two proposals um, in the Senate to strengthen the JJDPA and reauthorize it. There were a couple of important um, improvements to the core protections, at least um, from the campaign's perspective. Um, the removal protection was strengthened uh, to require that youth who are charged as an adult not be detained in adult facilities pre-trial. So this is the sort of expansion of the removal provision as it applies to youth um, in the juvenile justice system. That was included. Um, there was a provision to eliminate the valid court order exception to the DSO protection that Mark talked about. Uh, one iteration gave states three years to comply. The current, most recent iteration um, gives states just one year to apply unless they can show some sort of hardship. And again, that legislation is reflective of changes that are happening in states who are either declining to use it or actually passing their own legislation saying that it's not OK to use the valid court order exception to detain status offenders. Um, and then there were. Strengthening, there was strengthening language to the DMC requirement, um, sort of changing that moniker to racial and ethnic disparities, um, establishing a coordinating body within state advisory groups to oversee efforts to really show, um, show reductions in um, disparate treatment. So those are embodied in the last, and again, we're talking two Congresses ago, the last iteration of an actual bill that was moving. There were also there was also additional language in there with um, better, more informed definitions on trauma-informed care, on clarifying gender and sexual orientation, on isolation and the use of isolation. Um, there was a little bit more focus on gender-specific services and technical assistance for girls programming for juvenile court judges. So there were other 
aspects of um, the law that were improved to sort of reflect best practices and reflect some of the needs and some of the more current research. So we had a workable bill in 2009 that didn't get anywhere. And while all of this was going on, and you can go to the next slide, please, um, we're also dealing with serious declines in funding for the JJDPA and related JJ programs. So this slide sort of shows you how funding has declined over the last decade, at least through FY12. And right around FY08 is when the Great Recession hit and the belt tightening really began. Um, I think it probably began in earnest in 2010 um, because that's when we saw efforts to pass a comprehensive deficit reduction Bill, and I don't want to bring everybody back to some of that, some of those politics and some of that, but it really did impact the discretionary funding that Congress appropriates and, you know, um, Title II and Title V of the JJDPA, as well as JBIG and some of these other programs, is all discretionary monies. It has to be appropriated every year by Congress. So um, as you can see from this chart, huge cuts in Title II and Title V, and really significant um, cuts to the Juvenile Accountability Block Grant, too, over the last decade. So next slide, please. So where we are today, as I said, in 2011, after attempts to pass a comprehensive deficit reduction package essentially failed in Congress, the Budget Control Act was enacted. And why that is significant is it put into place um, it put into place rules around if Congress could not reduce the deficit by a certain target, then there was going to be an automatic trigger called sequestration that kicked into place in 2013 and went at exact around 8, 8.5% across the board cuts to all non-defense discretionary spending. So we saw sequestration hit in 2013. Um, I think there was a a decent amount of outcry um, by a lot of different folks, members of this coalition, the Act for JJ campaign, the Coalition for Juvenile Justice, the Campaign for Youth Justice, and over 3,000 other national, state, and local organizations signed letters um, opposing these non-defense discretionary cuts, sort of explaining how it was just a lot of cost shifting for state budgets and there were needs that still needed to be met. And there was a decent amount of pressure, and in 2014, there was a budget agreement that restored some of the sequestration for the FY14 fiscal year and the FY15 fiscal year, which they're currently working on. Um, but come 2016, sequestration is back. And I give all of that budget background um, sort of prepare folks for the fact that even though these budget numbers for the current fiscal year we're in and the one we're looking at, don't look great, it's only going to get worse if we have to also deal with sequestration on top of the caps that we're currently um, limited by as a result of all of the deficit reduction and budget um, agreements that have taken place since 2008. So this slide sort of gives you a little bit more detailed uh, picture of where we've been over the last couple of years. Um, you can see that the administration has tried to up some funding as well as suggest funding for a couple of new streams, including some competitive grants for girls um, and some monies for um, juvenile justice realignment incentive grants for working on deincarceration efforts. But unfortunately, those dollars have not made it out of Congress. And so we're usually um, in a position of just trying to preserve at least what we had from the prior fiscal year. And we've had, I'd say, not great success at that either. Um, in this last go-round, the JVIG dollars were zeroed out in the Senate for the first time. And so that was what was carried over in the, I mean, in the agreement between the House and the Senate for the first time. So I think it is highly um, Unlikely we're going to see JVIC funds in this next appropriation cycle, although we do have uh, a remaining opportunity with the Senate bill, which will, will be considered next week. So we'll have, to, we'll have to see what comes out. But 
you know, appropriators, to be fair, are working under some pretty tight statutory budget caps that make all of this um, very difficult and, unfortunately for us, um, threaten the ability to implement the JJDPA. So at the one hand, while we are trying to um, encourage Congress to take up and pass a reauthorization that will strengthen the law, we also have to be mindful of the fact without the resources to implement the law, you know, we're going to not, we're going to be left with the inability to kind of execute the good things that we're trying to get in a reauthorization bill. So um, that's sort of the kind of takes us up to today, but I do think the funding picture is important to understand um, and have in the back of your mind as we're talking about what a reauthorization might look like. And you can go to the next slide. So I think, as everybody on the call knows, this year is the 40th anniversary of original passage of the statute. Um, there is an effort to get a bipartisan bill reintroduced this year, led by Senator Whitehouse. And we understand Senator Grassley is working with him. So we are hopeful that it will, again, be a bipartisan effort. Um, while we have been sort of encouraged by that conversation and are awaiting sort of the results of those conversations between those members, uh, separate bills have been introduced on parts of the data EPA, most notably um, one bill, both in the House and now we expect it to be introduced in the Senate to eliminate the VCO exception um, to the DSO protection. So some members of Congress who want to see a reauthorization are trying to sort of take pieces of improvements to the law and push them out there, um, which we as a coalition are supportive of because it allows for some educational opportunities and um, allows us to kind of talk with members to try to um, both educate them and get some support on some aspects of what a strengthened reauthorization would look like. So that's good news. Um, this, not this Monday, but June 9th, there will be a field hearing in Pawtucket, Rhode Island on the JDDPA that Senator Whitehouse and Senator Grassley are um, conducting. Uh, Bob Lissenby, the OJJDP administrator, is expected to be a witness and testify. Um, the panel is not final yet. It will probably be announced early next week, but it is the first hearing we've had on the JJDPA since the one um, in 2008 and 2009. So it's been several years since there's even been a conversation among authorizers about the law. So all of this is good news. Um, but at the same time, we need to continue to fight the cuts um, and deal with this world of really tight budget caps and sequestration. So part of doing that um, is the Act for JJ campaign continues to be actively keeping on top of this and has um, worked with an organization called Spark Action to develop an action center where we have been posting blogs about why JJDPA matters, um, why it matters for youth of color, why it matters for mental health, why it matters for girls, um, lots of different themes, lots of different information from different Act for JJ campaign members to kind of underscore how important the law is um, to all of the constituencies that work with youth, even if it's not obvious. We just had a blog by the school psychologist. Um, so that's a good resource to kind of keep the conversation going about the law and the importance of the law. And that is also a place where you can go to take action, to talk to your legislator, to weigh in on this, or you can you know, pass that information on to others. Um, so it's an important tool we've been trying to use to highlight the importance of the law in this 40th anniversary year. And I'm happy to take questions at the end, but I think with that I will hand it over to Carmen to talk a little bit more about the role of the SAG. Thanks, Jill, and thanks, Mark. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of the state advisory groups. Many of you on the call today are part of these groups or are interested in being a part of this. And you know, we'll, we'll go through some of the specific responsibilities and inherent roles of the SAGs. I'll say that you know, SAGs are one of those mandated things under the JDDPA. I feel like they're often underutilized. 
um, understaffed and oftentimes misunderstood. And I think in light of everything that's happening on the Hill, SAGs can play a very vital and important role um, in reauthorization and moving the ball forward with the JDDPA. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Just a quick uh, composition and role. The memberships are appointed by the governors, but like Mark said, in D.C. it's here by the mayor. Um, it's comprised of 15 to up to 33 members. And I feel like one of the crucial pieces of this is one-fifth of the membership must be under age 24 when they're appointed. And three members have to have been or currently are under the jurisdiction of the juvenile justice system. Um, the majority of members cannot be full-time government employees, including the chair. And at least one has to be a locally elected official. So the JDDPA really tries to get a diverse body of voices and members to sit around that table and have these discussions. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So the roles that are mandated are spelled out through the JDDPA. Um, the first one is the is participating in the development of the state plan. Each jurisdiction is responsible for creating a three-year plan um, around juvenile justice in your state, determining where funding will be allocated, uh, what are your priority areas, whether it's diversion, um, removal of kids from jails and prisons, um, deinstitutionalization de of status offenses. Whatever those priorities are, those go in the three-year plan. And it's something SAG oftentimes do, but then they forget to look back on those each year and kind of reevaluate where you are in the plan and sharing those plans with those people responsible for, um, for meeting those goals that you've spelled out. and you told the federal government that you would do. A big one is advising the chief executive and legislature, the mayor, the governor, your council on compliance with the four core requirements that we've discussed throughout the webinar. And then also I highlight this one, obtain input from youth currently under the jurisdiction of the juvenile justice system. SAG struggle with this one greatly. I mean, I'll be honest with you, a lot of the state advisory group meetings can be boring. They can very, be very wonkish full of acronyms and not very juvenile youth friendly. And that's something that we have to strive and try to do when we meet and, and carve out space and time for youth to be a true member and not just checking off a box of requirements to say, yes, we have youth membership. But how are we utilizing and obtaining that input from youth? Are your SAGs doing focus groups with the youth? Are you allowing youth to lead some of your SAG meetings? What, what really is their role on your state advisory group? SAGs are also um, responsible for reviewing and commenting on grant proposals. Um, Jill and Mark talked about the money that comes, that flows from the, from the feds. And SAGs are responsible for looking at those grants and determining, okay, based on the priorities you have laid out in that three-year plan and on the four core requirements, what organizations or agencies are going to receive that funding, as little as it may seem. And next piece of that is to monitor those programs. Uh, I've seen you know, SAG do the grant proposal process and then kind of let it go until the next grant cycle without really monitoring where those monies have been invested in the state. So it's been very important that you know, during your state advisory group meetings, whether they're monthly, bi-monthly, um, quarterly, that there's time carved out to, to evaluate those programs and monitor um, their progress with your juvenile justice specialist. Next slide, please. And then there are inherent responsibilities not necessarily spelled out in the JGDPA. Um, and simply put, it's to advocate, impact, and influence. If you're not doing these three things in your state advisory group, it may be time to rejigger and reevaluate who is sitting around the table and, and what's being done when you all meet. Um, carve them out in areas of policy, procedures, system change reform. Um, it's not just about, and oftentimes it's what people think, it's looking at grants and seeing where the money goes, but it goes, it goes deeper than that. Um, the people who are appointed to the state advisory groups are supposed to be ex experts in the field of juvenile justice and be able to sit around that table and share ideas on how to reform the system, um, how to change policies, understand what policies exist within your statutes and agencies, that may not conform or make sense in, through the lens of the JDBPA. Um, so you're really there to evaluate those systems and make recommendations for reforms. 
Next slide, please. And so I see you can't really do any of those things without having youth, having that youth input, understanding the perspective of impacted um, populations. So somebody asked, what is the role of youth on a SAG? It's critical. I mean, it's, it's, it's the most important piece of the puzzle, I think. Understanding what programs are effective, you need to talk to the youth. You need to talk to the parents. Um, it's not enough just to collect data and just hear from the agencies, but really how how are these programs working on the ground? How is this mentor program program really working with, with the youth and your community? Uh, next slide. So switching gears just a little bit, I was also asked to talk about some of the limitations of the core requirements. And I won't go into this too much because I think we would like to hear some questions for you all, and I feel like we've talked about the core requirements quite a bit today. But if you go to the next slide, please. And the first one is the, the DSO. And so just kind of reiterating, wrapping up what both Mark and Jill have discussed today, um, the DSO, I, I really spell it out here, what it is, and the, the limitations of DSO, as we've mentioned, is the ballot court order exception. Um, and here are some recommendations. So, you know, when Jill's talking about Act for JJ and the 40th year anniversary that's coming up, these are recommendations that can come from SAG, a lot of, not just our coalition members, but you know, it's very. I think it's great. now is a critical time for state advisory groups to step up and have have an independent voice and understand um, what what recommendations you can put forward. And so these are some we have we have put forward as a coalition. These are some I've seen through PTAs, um, which are active on the Act for JJ and other um, coalitions. So basically, eliminating the DCO. And this is supported not only through our coalition members, but also um, the VCO is supported by a, a number of judges um, and prosecutors. So I think it's important to know who is supporting these sort of recommendations. Next slide, please. The next one is the removal of youth from adult jails and lockup, the jail removal. Mark and Jill have talked about this. Um, the limitations, this does not protect youth that are waived to adult court. Uh, especially in states with the lower age of court jurisdiction of 17 or 16, like North Carolina, New York, Louisiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, there's 10 of them. And if you're 17, um, you are considered an adult for criminal uh, liability purposes. And so the JDDPA does not protect those kids, um, even if they commit low-level misdemeanors. Next slide, please. And then, you know, goes hand in hand with the jail removal, and that's the sight and sound separation. And it does not apply to youth, again, prosecuted in the adult criminal justice system. So there's a theme. Obviously, kids in the adult system are, are basically um, ignored in the JDDPA, and I think that's an opportunity um, for state advisory groups to look at and, I, and look at the flow of kids in the adult system in your jurisdiction. Um, I'll use Illinois as a great example. The Illinois State Advisory Group has released a report about kids in the adult system, and it really bolstered the efforts to raise the age there. Once they sat around the table, the agencies and the SAG members and identified the gaps and the fiscal impact of having kids under 18 in the adult system. And through the work of the SAG and through the work of advocates and families, they were able to raise the age. But I will say it's not without that data. It's so critical and information that the state advisory group um, collected that wouldn't have been possible. Next slide. And then finally, the DMC. Um, easy recommendation, right? Strengthen the DMC core protection by requiring states to take concrete steps to reduce racial and ethnic disparities in the JJ system. Um, you know, why is this important? We know that African American youth represent only 17% of the overall youth population, but they make up 40% of those held in the juvenile detention facilities. And we know that Latino youth are incarcerated nearly twice as often as white youth. And this disparate impact is, is even worse as you go deeper into the system and you look at kids in the adult system. So I think you know some recommendations that have come from this is establishing state coordinating bodies to oversee efforts to reduce disparities, 
um, creating systems to collect local data at every point of contact youth have with the juvenile justice system. And then disaggregating that by race, ethnicity, um, offense, and then identifying where, where the disparities exist and the causes of those disparities. And that's where I see a, a state advisor group playing a very crucial uh, part in DMC and racial and ethnic disparity reduction. And then some other recommendations for this are developing and implementing plans to address disparities that include measurable objectives for change, um, publicly report findings, which is rare. I know if your jurisdictions are anything like DC, it's oftentimes very difficult to get the data that's necessary to make the changes and understand how systems flow and how kids are entering the system, um, especially youth who are involved in several other agencies, whether it's your child and family services, mental health services, um, school disciplinary you know, systems. So it's very important that that, those information be, that information be available to the public. But oftentimes, too, I see SAGs having what I call analysis paralysis. You have all of this um, information and all of this data, and it's so overwhelming that now you're at a point where you can't do anything because you, you're, you're paralyzed by the data. Um, and then another recommendation is just evaluating progress towards reducing disparities. And like I said, I feel like the four core requirements, especially if you're in a SAG, that you're not quite sure what your role is and where you can exercise influence or impact, just going back to the basics of the four core requirements um, and understanding your role as SAG and, uh, and where your voice can be heard. And I think that is it for me, short and sweet. Great. Thank you, Carmen. Um, at this point, we've, uh, we've put the contact information of all our presenters um, up on the screen for you, and I want to thank them for doing such a great job. Um, we'd like to open the floor for questions. Like I said, you can type your question into the questions box, or you can click the raise your hand feature, and I can announce and unmute you. I will say that if you're on a cell phone, we strongly encourage you to type your questions in just to avoid any kind of audio feedback. So I'll give everyone a minute or so to type in their questions. Okay, our first question is from Andrew Smith. He says, how can JJ reform succeed with the increasing budget cuts? Well, since I focused on the budget, I guess that, that's directed mostly towards me. I, I think it's really a challenge. I think it's incredibly important, as Carmen outlined, that constituencies that work with young people or work in agencies that work with these young people speak up about the important role the federal dollars play in leveraging state funds, and in some cases um, even private funds, to both comply with the core protections, but also to implement programming or do data collection. Um, I think the more we get information out to particular legislators about the importance, it's not a huge investment, to be honest. I mean, you're talking about $250 million overall, which, uh, you know, in the scope of the federal budget is just a drop in the bucket. So I think it's really important for SACs to think creatively about how they can communicate how far they make a dollar go in their state and what it you know does to help meet the needs of the kids in their state what it does to help um, you know reduce crime and delinquency I mean public safety is an important message for legislators as well and to the extent that you can show that those that investment gets you a really good return on the dollar which we know research bears out to be true I think it's just really important to raise that but I do think it's going to be hard. I, I just um, I think we've got to keep sort of pushing the economic component of the message along with the service uh, component of the message and, and um, do that as often as we can. Great. Our next question is from Debbie Vanizak. She says, what are examples of what other SAGs are doing to increase youth input? Great. I think um, I've, we've seen some SAGs uh, kind of have a, a separate youth auxiliary group that may meet more frequently than the general um, SAG bodies, but either elect or choose a representative or two or three that will, tend, that will attend the uh, formal SAG meetings and 
set their own agenda priorities based on the three-year plan, um, giving them, giving the youth a very uh, concrete project that they develop and are able to implement is very important. But, you know, to be honest, you have to have some sort of incentive system set up or these youth have to feel like they're getting something out of it um, in order to be fully invested in this, whether it's uh, sustaining members or mentorship with SAG members, that's something DC is thinking about doing, is pairing up some of our um, SAG members with the youth members to have a sustained relationship that way, um, providing transportation tokens if that's possible um, for the SAG, um, connecting with the schools that oftentimes require um, volunteer hours before a youth graduates is, is a great avenue since on many SAGs the school uh, body is involved. But there has to be a give and take with youth and meeting them where they're at and making the meetings when they are there, carving out time for them to be involved as well. Our next question is, what would you assess our top priority or your top priority for a potential reauthorization? Um, as far as the what policy should be included, or I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Yes. Well, I think the strengthening of the core protections, I mean, that is sort of the um, core, not no pun intended, but it is the heart of the law. Um, I know from the Campaign for Youth Justice's perspective, you know, our mission is getting um, kids out of adult facilities, so we know the research shows that it's not good for public safety, it's not good for the youth, that most um, adult corrections folks don't want to have the young people there, so that's definitely a priority for us, but I also think um, we're seeing a lot of traction with eliminating the valid court order exception so that status offenders don't have an entry point into secure confinement. I think that's really important, too, and the National um, Juvenile Family Court judges has come around on this in the last three, four years and support eliminating the VCO as an association. So I think those are two big ones. Um, but I also think that strengthening the, the racial and ethnic disparities protection so that it has a little bit more teeth to it, um, a little bit more direction, a little bit more requirement that disparities actually be reduced and not just sort of looked at or addressed in some vague way. Um, those are all really important, and those improvements are borne out by research. They're based on research that shows if we make some of these strengthening requirements and then we provide the resources to help states implement them, we'll do better by kids and we'll do better by public safety. So I think anything that can build on those core protections is really, um, you know, it's what the Act for Digi campaign is all about at its heart, and I think those are the, the priority issues. But I, I defer to Mark or Carmen for additional thoughts. Well, I, would, I would just second what, what Jill said. I think that's right. The, the core protections have always been uh, the heart of the act, and so to continue those protections are, are very important. OK, I'm going to give everyone about 30 more seconds to get their questions in. And Naomi? Yes. Naomi? I would ask whether it's appropriate, and I'm going to just go ahead and do it anyway, to make a plug for the call-in day on June 3rd. Yes. We actually had a, a question coming up from someone about what issues were the most important regarding juvenile justice to contact legislators about right now um, and who they should reach out to in that event. So that's a perfect segue, Jill. Great. So um, I did do a lot of talk about the funding. Um, while we are still waiting to get a little bit more clarity on what is going to happen with reauthorization, the timing of which may be later in the summer or the fall, um, they are making funding decisions in the Senate next week. Uh, the Senate subcommittee that has jurisdiction over juvenile justice funding is looking at its appropriations bill on Tuesday, June 3rd, and the full committee will then take it up on June 5th. So the Act for JJ campaign is um, hosting a national call-in day on June 3rd. 
and I'm sure CJJ will forward the information, but there's a online call-in alert you can use um, to dial into your legislators. The target is mostly members of the Senate Appropriations Committee, but quite frankly, all senators should hear from you and your states about the importance of this funding, um, even if they're not on the committee making the initial decisions next week. It'll still come before the full Senate shortly thereafter this summer. So I think it's a good opportunity to do some of that educating, to talk about how these federal dollars are being used in your state and some of the outcomes that you're getting. So I would encourage you to engage um, in that. We've given folks, in addition to uh, a call-in sort of talking points alert they can use, there's an email alert, there are social media posts, there's Facebook posts, there's tweets. I'm not a Twitterer, but <laughs> a tweeter. But um, we've provided a whole bunch of resources to allow you to weigh in quick and easy. But I think volume on this issue um, would be would say something because we don't usually get I don't think members usually get volume with respect to juvenile justice, and so that would be great. Um, our next question is from Lara Herskovich. I agree with others who say the terminology we use for DMC is becoming outdated as minority communities become majority and that we should frame DMC as equal treatment and fairness instead of disproportionate minority context. Do you have thoughts about this in relation to reauthorizing the JJDPA, possibly changing the language in it? Yeah, and, uh, the latest, uh, again, I don't know what is being circulated at the moment, but S-678, um, there were recommendations to change that terminology to racial and ethnic disparities. Um, doesn't fully embrace, I think, what you're saying, but there is increased, there are cha language changes in there that reflect sort of general fairness for kids, but I think there's also an acknowledgement not to lose sight of the, to lose sight of the fact that there, that there, there are still particular populations that we want to make sure are not lost in addressing disparate treatment. Okay, and our last question is from Steve Sello Sellover. Excuse me. Can regulations be used to strengthen the core requirements, and is there any discussion happening at OJJDP to update regulations? Well, um, <laughs> we thought there might be. Um, Administrator Listenby talked about wanting to issue regulations. The short answer is yes. There can be, some of these things can be done through regulation. We haven't had a comprehensive review of JJDTA regulations since 1996, I think. Um, and uh, uh, Administrator Listenby said in December that he, that his agency was going to propose some regulations and then um, has sort of backed away from that and, and we're not expecting to see them anytime soon, which is why I think we've sort of switched back to focusing on getting a strong reauthorization out there that's bipartisan to at least signal to OJJDP um, what those policy priorities ought to look like so that if regulations got picked back up uh, as a priority for the agency, um, you know, they've had some at least guidance as to what Congress is thinking. Again, I don't want to speak for OJJDP, but but the, the latest I understand, and anyone else on the call who might have more information than I do, is that that has been back for the time being. Okay, um, thank you everyone for your questions. If you have um, any other questions now or after the webinar, you can see the the presenter's information, contact information is on the screen. I want to thank Mark, Jill, and Carmen for doing a great job at presenting. Um, this webinar has been recorded and will be up on the CJJ website if you want to share with your colleagues. And thank you. That is all from us, and have a great day. Thanks. Thanks.